Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Heartbeat, the place where I get to talk about, today anyways, one of the things that has ever made this little guy tick. Yes, today I get to talk about Star Wars. Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Join me, won't you? It really is impossible to fully recount all the ways that Star Wars has affected my heart and my mind over the years. I mean, if it wasn't the hand that actually planted my passion and wide-eyed enthusiasm for art, it certainly was at least the, the sunshine and the rain that helped it to grow. I mean, one of my very first creations was something called Star Final, which was my own intergalactic adventure featuring the orphan, Ryan Radiar, who was helped by his furry G-Walk friends to destroy the evil space station, the shooting Saturn. But of course, so sitting down on Thursday night, getting ready to watch another fan's further expansion of a galaxy far, far away was just electrifying. But now, my friends, I must take pause and say, considering that not many of you actually need further convincing to journey to your local cinema to watch this film, and also looking at the box office numbers, I would assume that many of you have probably already seen it more than once, I'm going to include spoilers in this review. So with that said, if you haven't seen the film, guys, please pause this video right now, click away, go watch the movie, enjoy it, then come back and watch this. Because for me, a lot of my enjoyment of this film came from the fact that I didn't know what was gonna happen next. I was constantly smiling, not just because the twists and the turns surprised me, but because I was able to allow the film and the story that was being told versus my own preconceptions guide me where it wanted to go. Though, quite humorously, it was that same unknown factor that had me almost in constant torment for three years. And it's not just because I'm a very impatient guy, but the idea of a new creative team coming in and trying to continue one man's singular vision in a way that felt cohesive and respectful, but also bold, fresh, and true to who those artists were, just felt impossible to me. And then a lot of the early announcements and interviews and press just did nothing to abate my fears. Just the constant, hey guys, it's all practical again. There's nothing to worry about. Which, first of all, is a rather inaccurate contrast to the prequels. But regardless, I just kept thinking even the coolest practical effects in the world do not make a film good or bad. Just see the awesomeness of The Life of Pi or the blandness of The Dark Knight Rises. And on top of that, a lot of the content, not all of the content, but a lot of the content that has come out of Lucasfilm leading up to the release of this film, from the comic books, to the novels, to the TV shows, has been so detrimentally reactionary. Like Lucasfilm, because of the negative response to the prequels, is just terrified to do anything but imitate the originals. But that so rarely works when the creative team behind the scenes is just trying to imitate something else. When it's not their own, when they don't own it to the marrow, you just feel the insincerity, and that's the feeling that pervades so much of Star Wars Rebels for me. And though it is slowly improving and there have been elements that I have enjoyed, by and large, it really does feel like this kind of unfortunate attempt to just mimic Lucas, visually and musically, where at one time those elements, when paired together, felt intentional and meaningful, now they just kind of feel arbitrary, dull, and lifeless. And on a project like this, the artists behind it can be further crippled if instead of listening to this story and watching these characters, they instead just start setting out for themselves a series of boxes that need checked that are mandated by either the fans or the studio or even their own past work. And that's exactly the feeling I got on Abrams' Star Trek Into Darkness, where because he had succeeded in a number of significant ways on the first Star Trek film, he and his cast just seemed intent on duplicating that exact same feeling on the second go around without really considering the actual narrative and what could make it feel fresh, exciting, and engaging. And in interviews, even Mr. Mark Hamill has stated things like, the whole idea of trying to recapture the past? That's a big mistake. And to a certain extent, I think a lot of the backlash against Jurassic World came from that feeling of imagination being replaced by imitation. And so when word came out that J.J. Abrams is taking over Star Wars, I got all the more nervous, because even as he's talked about how much Star Wars has influenced him over the years, there is still no denying how different his filmmaking style is from Mr. George Lucas. Whereas J.J. Abrams tends to elect emotion from the audience by bringing them in close to his character's face and instructing them to join them in what they're experiencing, Mr. Lucas tends to hold back a bit more and juxtapose images and show us what the characters are seeing and then allow us to project our feelings onto those characters. And this was definitely a style of filmmaking that was on display in the scene where Luke returns home to find his Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru killed by the Empire. 
Because in that moment, it was Mark Hamill's instinct to fall on his knees and just start weeping. But it was Lucas that told him to hold back, because like I said, he really wanted to allow the audience to grieve as little or as much as they themselves felt they wanted to in that moment. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying that one style of filmmaking is better or worse. I'm simply just highlighting how different they are and how nervous I then became thinking that Abrams would try and adopt a style of filmmaking that wasn't his own. Because he had, after all, already made his own intergalactic adventure with Star Trek, so why wouldn't he then try and distinguish this film by trying to do something different? And even as I watched the first couple trailers or read interviews with J.J. Abrams where he would say things like, this film needed to be something that didn't feel like it was made by a programmer, where it felt like there were boxes that just needed to be checked off, I still had to remain cautious in my optimism. But then I was in the theater watching that iconic yellow text disappear off into space and the camera pan down. And within moments, I saw JJ as bold and dynamic and energetic as I've ever seen him. I simultaneously felt like I was back in a galaxy far, far away, but also that a very different set of hands was guiding me through it. And what really blew my mind is second after second of The Force Awakens ticked by is I not only didn't mind that, but I was actually enjoying it a lot. And J.J. Abrams did one better than just maintain the visual style that we've come accustomed to seeing in Mission Impossible 3, Star Trek, and Super 8. I actually saw him in a very fitting and natural way grow. I saw him drawing inspiration from filmmakers like Terrence Malick, the director behind visual masterpieces like Tree of Life, The Thin Red Line, and The New World. Or even Kurosawa, who Lucas himself endlessly both visually and narratively referenced in his own films. And something else that J.J. has improved upon immensely in this film is just how he's shot, composed, and edited his aerial dogfights. I mean, just comparing the insanely sloppy, utterly forgettable chasing that happens in Star Trek Into Darkness to the Millennium Falcon chase through the wrecked Star Destroyer. It is truly phenomenal how far he has come. I mean, I actually remember specific beats and images from that sequence. Though, to be balanced, I will say that the final attack on Starkiller Base still does not hold a candle to either attack on either Death Star. Though, at the same time, to compare this film to the ending of Episode 1, I wouldn't say that the aerial dogfights are actually the focus of those finales, but the lightsaber duels that are being intercut with them. Now, I love the lightsaber duels in the prequels. I just think they showcase so well what the Jedi look like and what they fought like when they were in their prime, when they were fully trained and just lightning fast. But I also really enjoyed the lightsaber duel between Kylo Ren and Finn and eventually Rey. I just thought it was fantastic. And no, not because it was like the originals, but because it made sense to those characters. One was untrained and one was mortally wounded, so they would do battle in that way. And just the wildness of their blows not only gave us these striking visuals of trees being hewn into and just crashing to the ground, but it also communicated so well Rey's desired attachment to her would-be but now dead surrogate father, as well as Kylo's just untrained rage and fear. Though to talk about something just a little less grim, it was also great to see J.J. Abrams' very distinct style of humor really alive and kicking on this film. From that first line of Pose, to Kylo Ren, to the crazy hijinks between Finn and BB-8, to the crazy tentacled creature that was eating all of the guys from the Raid films, it was just great to see that happening. And though it is very distinct from George Lucas's sense of humor on the other Star Wars films, it still worked for me because it was alive, and it was fresh, and it was personal. And speaking of alive, fresh, and personal, one of the greatest highlights, if not the highlight of this film for me, was just all the new characters. From Poe, to Finn, to Rey, to Kylo Ren, or should I say, spoilers guys, turn back now, Ben Solo. But more on him later. I mean, only someone as talented as Oscar Isaacs, who has really proven his range on great films like Inside Lewin Davis and Ex Machina, could make us believe in one scene that he and Finn had gone from enemies to being friends. And then Daisy Ridley, wow. I mean, this girl has virtually done nothing prior to this film, and then bam, here she is. Not just an actress who's appeared in a few other films and is now in a Star Wars film, but she is Ray, just so owning that character with such a Luke Skywalker sense of earnestness. And I think some of my favorite shots of the entire film were just her scavenging a Star Destroyer and using a piece of scrap metal to sled down a massive sand dune. And then there was Boyega. Oh, John Boyega, what a hoot to watch. I mean, in such an enjoyable way, he was so clearly geeking out every single scene. I mean, <laughs> I just had this image in my mind of JJ calling cut, and then he just kind of had these little geek out moments all by himself, like, oh, I'm in a Star Wars film. You want to do it again, JJ? Let's do it, let's go again. Yes, that is my great Boyega impression. 
And it was also so great seeing JJ really appropriately guiding those performances, ensuring that things like that giddiness never got in the way of the story he was wanting to tell or the tone that he was trying to strike. Because that is something that he has occasionally had problems with in the past, especially on Into Darkness with Benedict Cumberbatch just chewing up the scenery. And for me on The Force Awakens, the only time that things got a little bit close to that was with Dominic Gleeson's speech to the First Order troops on Starkiller Base. I could definitely see the intentions parallel to Hitler giving one of his infamous, extremely passionate speeches. Just for me anyways, it felt a little too on the nose. And JJ's style of filmmaking was also just so present in the overall structure of this film. It was just so apparent to me how much he loved the fact that there was 30 years between Return of the Jedi and this film, because that really gave him license to put the audience in a much more unknown place, along with the characters, which then allowed us to discover things and uncover things along with them versus just serve a pre-existing story. And it's that exact same approach that he took on so much of Alias and Lost and Mission Impossible 3. Of course, I am not saying that this is a perfect film, though my first negative isn't so much a critique as it is me expressing my confusion, that in a world with avatars, Gollum, Caesar and Davy Jones, why were Maz and especially Snoke just so unrealistic? I just don't get it. Though I will legitimately critique something now and say as fresh and as new as the tone and characters felt on this film, I did find the vehicle and spaceship designs to be particularly uninspired and like they weren't really expanding this universe all that much. Like JJ was just playing it safe and giving the fans what they wanted to see by literally copying some of Ralph McQuarrie's abandoned concept art from the original film. Also, he didn't do a great job at kind of creating new, iconic, and cohesive planets. Besides Jakku, I actually couldn't even tell you the name of Maz's planet or the one where Luke was hiding out on or how they were visually distinct from episode 1's Naboo. And though this wasn't the end of the world, I just felt like he could have done a better job at expanding the universe versus just visiting planets that were reminiscent of Tatooine, Endor, and Hoth. Now, my next critique is actually much less severe than I thought it would be, that critique being just the presence of the original cast on this film. An idea that in the past I've seen works much better in concept than in execution. Because you just look at someone like Carrie Fisher, and it's just so difficult today to take the idea of her returning as Princess Leia seriously. And I definitely felt like poor Karen Allen had similar issues on Indiana Jones 4. To contrast that film though, I really felt like Abrams and Kasdan both very much made the right choice in not having this film in any way hinge on Fisher's performance, or really have her do much more than deliver a few lines of dialogue and really express just the war-weary sadness of a woman who had lost her son and husband husband and the New Republic which she had fought so hard to establish. Harrison, on the other hand, was asked to do quite a bit in this film. And though he did do a fairly solid job, there were just a number of moments that he still couldn't help but feel like the aging heavyweight whose style just didn't quite mesh with the new contenders. As far as other elements that fall short on this film, I've heard a fair number of complaints that there was too little Phasma, too little Luke, and a plot that was far too similar to episodes 4 and 6. And to those who have made those complaints, I will say, you're not wrong. There is very little Phasma in the film, Luke does only appear in it for the last 30 seconds, and the attack on Starkiller Base was nearly identical to the attacks on both of the Death Stars. But I will say, with the first two of those points anyways, I don't think the filmmakers made the wrong choice. For me, there was something admirably simple and expertly focused about this film. Because when it came down to it, nearly everything in this film hinged upon the Luke is missing plot point. It was what directly pulled Rey, Finn, and Poe on this exciting new adventure. It was the reason that the Empire had been reincarnated into the First Order. It was directly connected to why Han and Leia were no longer together. And it was connected directly to why Kylo Ren had allied himself with Snoke. So if this film really wanted to do justice to all those ideas that demonstrated to the audience what this galaxy had endured for over 30 years, it would have been an incredible disservice not to make the audience wait just like this galaxy had for Luke's return. Or another way to look at it, bringing Luke back too early would have kind of felt like tacking a Dawn of Justice subtitle onto a Batman v Superman film. Can that film just not exist? But back on this film, with all the new characters and all the new points of view to invest and engage in, it really would have hurt them, as well as characters like Phasma, to just cram them in there and rush our getting to know them. And finally, and in my opinion most importantly, this is the film where Han Solo dies. And we really needed to devote as much time and attention to that character as possible. And even so, even as I saw JJ realizing that truth, realizing that he couldn't simply rest on our pre-existing experience with Han Solo from episodes 4 through 6, but he actually had to make us fall in love with this character in this film, in order for his death to actually mean something, I still found his demise didn't pack the emotional punch that it could and should have. 
Although, were I to view his death as a catalyst, similar to the death of Obi-Wan in episode four, or the death of Qui-Gon in episode one, it actually worked quite well, because in the same way that those characters' deaths were catalysts that propelled both Luke and Anakin onward, so will Han's death propel both Rey and Kylo. Now, to jump back to my praise of the kind of very simple search for Luke plotline, I'm actually going to use that exact same argument to criticize the attack on Starkiller Base. Because for me, what bothered me most about that sequence wasn't the fact that it was similar to A New Hope or Return of the Jedi. Because in the same way that I didn't hate Avatar, because that familiar story was being handled by a fresh and enthusiastic set of hands. Once you were clearly interested in more than just checking boxes, so too was the handling of the finale on this film. Rather, what did bother me was the fact that it didn't necessarily play into that central storyline, again, that being the search for Luke. That plotline was put on hold for most of the final act, only to be very quickly returned to and resolved in kind of a classic Deus Machina situation. In this case, the Machina being R2-D2 himself. Which is also kind of classic JJ, start off really strong, only to stumble right before the end. Which is actually one of the reasons I'm not so sad that JJ won't be returning for more films. This episode of Star Wars was yet another one of his mystery boxes, so now I'm completely content and excited to have someone else, and perhaps a little more satisfying way, open it. As per the rest of the plot points that either mirrored or completely copied other Star Wars films, I would point out that there has been a very intentional track record of other Star Wars films rhyming with one another. And though I find the more successful examples to be more visual than narrative, this is certainly nothing new. Now there is a rather accurate critique of many modern blockbusters, that being so long as the film is infused with fun characters, even the dullest of visuals or most forgettable of plots will be forgiven. And I have little doubt that that exact same criticism will be thrown at The Force Awakens by different individuals because this film is chock-a-block full of fun characters, and there are some repetitious, potentially forgettable plot points along the way. But that does not take away from the fact that for me, the most enjoyable part of this film was watching these characters grow and change and evolve and their relationships with one another, as well as the relationships to the universe around them. It also does not rob this film of being able to explore the same ideas and themes that this franchise has for the last 40 years. The ones that have held audiences captive that entire time. The light versus the dark, fear, aggression, and anger leading to the dark side. Compassion, selflessness, and forgiveness leading to the light. The damage caused by removing children from their families. The strength found in friendships. But wow, it is time to wrap up this epic of a review and just say my final score for this film will be four out of five. I highly recommend this film, guys. I really hope that you've seen it considering you've made it all the way to the end of this review. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, I also just wanted to say even though my imagination hasn't expanded much since all those years ago when I was plagiarizing Star Wars with my own Star Final Universe, my understanding of just how many people share my love and passion for this universe certainly has. And whether you love this film or you hated it, I'm sure we can also just share in the fact that we want this universe to continue and we want it to flourish. And just to all of you who were posting and tweeting and talking, I just want to say to you guys right now, thank you for all that you've given me over the years. Thank you for the lightsaber battles and the Lego wars and the happy meals with Star Wars toys in them and just the endless discussions and the film viewings. Thank you, thank you. And as always, please comment below and let me know what you guys thought. Did you love the film? Did you hate it? Why? Let me know. Also, please do subscribe, guys. I'm going to continue to review films and television on this channel and I would love for you guys to continue to join me here. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.